Uh, and again, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, this is the 14th virtual town hall meeting that I've had. Tonight's gonna be a special one as we have uh, one of my favorite colleagues who's joined us, uh, Kathy Castor uh, from, uh, from Florida. I'll introduce her in, in just a moment. Uh, again, a reminder, uh, use the question and answer function, the bottom of the screen if you have a question. And uh, if your question for some reason doesn't get answered tonight, you can email me at thompson.townhall at mail.house.gov and uh, we'll get an answer to your question uh, right away. I, I want to uh, acknowledge and uh, introduce Katie uh, who's on the screen right now. Katie is uh, from my Washington DC office and she's the uh, moderator for tonight's uh, town hall. Uh, she's the one who'll be uh, reading your questions and, uh, and kind of making sure things go well. And she's also the one that's recording it for Facebook because the, the live stream uh, didn't work. Welcome to the challenges of technology in our new Zoom slash webinar uh, world. Um, I'm really honored that uh, we're here uh, together tonight. I wish we were in person uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm anxious to get back to the days when we can do these town hall meetings uh, in person. But uh, as long as we're in, uh, in the COVID pandemic situation, we'll continue to, uh, to meet each other uh, virtually. So uh, th again, thank you for being with us. And uh, tonight, I'm really honored that uh, my friend, Congresswoman Kathy Castor from Florida's 14th Congressional District uh, is joining us. Uh, Kathy is the chair of the House Select Committee on Climate Crisis. <laughs> this is a brand new select committee. It was created at the start of this Congress, and we're so proud that she is the first chair. She's pres uh, presided over the release of a very ambitious roadmap to help combat uh, climate change. And she's led hearings on the health risks of the climate crisis. And this is so very pertinent, especially to us in our district right now with yet another round of fires. And, uh, and, and uh, Kathy, you, you know, we've had seven years of fires in my district, uh, but this, is, this one started really early. So it started an early fire season and we have the rest of the fire season uh, to go. So uh, that's in part uh, why I've asked you to, to join me tonight. Uh, in addition to the select committee, uh, Congresswoman Castor serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And uh, that committee handles every imaginable policy from uh, healthcare to environmental policy uh, to technology uh, issues. And uh, you've done, I, I had a bill that just went through your committee that allowed yeah. fire victims uh, who uh, lost their home to be able to retain their phone number. Because uh, as the law is right now, if, you, if your house burns down, you lose your phone number. And, uh, and so we, want, we tried to give folks some cushion, you had enough to worry about uh, rebuilding your house, getting your life back together. You should be able to keep your phone number. And, yes. then, uh, and then this week, you guys passed another one of my bills that would reauthorize USADA, uh, the United States Anti-Doping uh, Agency, to make sure that uh, athletes don't, uh, uh, don't dope to enhance their performance. So uh, that, that just kind of gives you, uh, just from my perspective, the breadth of your jurisdiction. So Kathy, I wish you were here uh, live. You've been to my district before. Uh, you've been a guest in an event I had in Sonoma County. I uh, wish you were back. Uh, Jan and I miss you. Uh, you're, you're always welcome. And I'd like to yield to you to uh, make a few remarks. Well, thanks, Rep. Thompson. Thank you for the opportunity to join all of you uh, out in California. Uh, Mike, I know and love your district in uh, Napa and Sonoma and Santa Rosa. Uh, my eldest daughter is a recent Cal Berkeley grad, so we spent a lot of uh, quality time out there. But I have to say that um, from the get-go, I am so sorry that you all are suffering through another devastating fire year. I remember on one of my trips, out there with my husband, 
Uh, it was probably six to nine months after the Tubbs fire. And we went through Santa Rosa and just could not believe what had happened there. And now to, to be experiencing this year after year, and what we've learned because of drier, hotter conditions caused by the changing climate is that we cannot suffer through this any longer. And that was one of the uh, reasons Speaker Pelosi organized the uh, Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. While states like California have been ambitious in their climate goals and a lot of local communities and academic institutions, uh, the federal government has not. And it's time, it's past time. The time is urgent and our task is urgent. So I'll look forward to talking about our uh, solving the climate crisis congressional roadmap. Well, thank you very much. And although my district is experiencing fires as uh, is the rest of the West Coast in the Western United States, your area in the East Coast is experiencing horrific hurricanes right now. Uh, again, at a greater magnitude than we've seen in the past. And uh, there's something out there and uh, we, need to, we need to heed the message and, uh, and get to work on it. Well, I wanna, uh, I thought what I'd do is kick it off uh, with a couple of questions uh, from me before we turn it over to our, our viewers just to kind of get things going. So uh, uh, Congresswoman Castor, since your committee is brand new to this Congress, can you give us an overview of its jurisdiction? Yes, it's the planet. <laughs> Mike, when you're talking about climate change, I mean, it cuts across everything that we do in the Congress because the solutions have to be broad and they have to be ambitious. And so that means the power sector, it means the transportation sector, it means public lands, it means the missions uh, of the military and how we make our military installations more resilient. It is sweeping and so we are, our jurisdiction is as broad as ever and we could cut across all of the congressional committees and that's what we've done in our report, made recommendations to every committee in the Congress. Wow, so a committee that has more jurisdiction than energy and commerce, imagine that. So have, have you had some uh, any successes since you've uh, taken this over? And, and, and by the way, congratulations, because this is such a big issue. I imagine 90% um, of our delegation wanted to chair that committee. And to get on it, I know, was tough. Everybody wanted to be on it. But to get on it and be named the chair uh, is pretty remarkable. So congratulations to you on that. Tell, tell us about some of the work and some of your successes. Well, we took um, a very broad approach. Uh, in fact, one of those trips out to, to Cal in Berkeley, I remember was right after uh, Speaker Pelosi named me as chair. And I remember sitting down with a lot of the leading scientists and researchers there, and they gave me some very good advice from the get-go. But we, uh, we held 17 hearings. We started off with youth climate activists from across the country. We had Greta Thunberg at one of our hearings, but we reached out to scientists, entrepreneurs, uh, faith-based community, uh, farmers, uh, military leaders, and asked for their input. We uh, put a request for information on the street. Uh, we knew based upon the National Climate Assessment and the IPCC report, that we had to act as swiftly as possible and follow the science. So we rolled out our report at the uh, end of June and right off the bat, uh, this was, we knew this was not gonna be a report that was gonna sit on the shelf. In fact, a few days after that report, the House of Representatives passed the cleanest and greenest infrastructure package in our history in uh, the Moving Forward Act that contained your very important green act that we can talk a little bit more about, but that's HR2. Then on the heels of that, we passed the most climate friendly defense authorization act about a week later. And then the house has done its work and we passed our appropriations bills. Those also have historic investments for clean energy and building more resilient 
communities. If we had uh, working partners in the United States Senate and the White House, we would be ahead of the game. But at least now we're taking these, these steps. And, um, but like I said before, it's urgent. We, we can't spin our wheels any longer. We have to move. Well, that's fantastic. And imagine that, a chair that believes in science. That's, uh, that's good stuff. I guess you don't have to worry about uh, Scientific American endorsing your opponent. Right. <laughs> well, you know, um, you, you mentioned my green energy bill and in my role as the chair of the Select Revenue uh, Measures Subcommittee on Ways and Means, uh, I introduced that green energy package to help combat uh, climate change uh, through the tax code. And uh, that was a, uh, that, that was a, a pretty, uh, pretty big uh, move. Uh, and it's the first time that we've ever seen that much emphasis uh, using the tax code to address renewable energy and to uh, address the issue of climate change. And as you mentioned, uh, it was adopted in its entirety in the infrastructure bill. Uh, which uh, is the first time we've ever done anything like that. So how do you see my green energy bill, my, my tax code improvements for renewable energy, uh, fitting into your roadmap on climate? It's absolutely vital. It's one of the most important portions of our climate uh, roadmap because we have to ramp up renewables. We've got to ramp up clean energy. You know, California, thank you. You're ahead of the game, but but my state, we're supposedly the sunshine state. Ha, ah, we generate about 3% of our electricity from renewables. Isn't that outrageous? The sunshine state where we have so much solar potential. So your bill will press and incentivize uh, entrepreneurs, uh, utilities, others to move to the clean energy economy. Then you take what you're doing, Mike, in your, uh, for the transportation sector for electric vehicles, uh, because in our report, we recommend that no later than 2035, every new vehicle sold in America should be a net zero clean electric vehicle. Again, California, thank you, you've been a leader on this, but other parts of the country have got to get with it. And we think, uh, I'm not sure if you did an analysis on jo the jobs that would be created under your Green Act, but this is an enormous opportunity for the good old USA to build in America and expand our supply chains, make sure that our manufacturing base, industrial base is growing. And I think when, uh, when we have a new president and a working partner in the White House, it, they, I think that uh, Joe Biden has taken inspiration from your Green Act because it's part of his plan. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we heard a lot in the hearings uh, about the things that you just mentioned. Uh, in particular, uh, the uh, growth in uh, employment opportunities uh, through uh, incentivizing uh, this uh, move towards a renewable energy community. So uh, that'd be good. Nothing like uh, good new well-paying jobs and a clean, a clean uh, cl uh, climate and a, and a healthy planet. So uh, thank you very much. So I think uh, what we'll do now, uh, Katie, uh, if you could, is we'll move into uh, the questions from our viewing audience. All right, we got lots of questions, so it should be good. Good. Well, first question, this person says, oil and Oil and gas drilling, and especially fracking, continue unabated and are resulting in devastating methane emissions. The, Demo the Democratic Party doesn't seem to want to take on this issue, but this is absolutely crucial if we're going to slow down climate change. How are you wrestling with this? Madam Chair, you want to take that? Yeah, thanks. Hey, you, you're absolutely right. So we propose phasing out any of the tax subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. We uh, we recommend very serious controls on methane, uh, one of the most dangerous greenhouse gases. Uh, the Trump administration, as you know, has rolled back uh, methane controls that even a lot of the oil companies were not asking for. That's been part of their 
uh, rollback of about 100 environmental protections. We also recommend that uh, all fracking end on public lands and all new offshore oil drilling uh, come to an end. I, in fact, the House spot, uh, passed one of my bills to prevent, to prohibit offshore oil drilling off the coast of Florida. We've also adopted in the House what we recommended in our report, no new offshore drilling. We just can't rely on the fossil fuels any longer. You, can, you all are experiencing the consequences firsthand. That's why the transition to clean energy is so urgent. And we recommend, uh, aligned with the science, that the power sector, we decarbonize the power sector as soon as possible, but no later than 2040. And I think it's important to note that uh, change doesn't happen overnight, nor is it instantaneous. And we have a big country. We have 435 members of Congress, 100 different members of the Senate, uh, and all of them have different ideas and represent different parts of the country. And, uh, and everybody doesn't think alike. So the work that you're doing, Kathy, and your committee, you're able to showcase uh, the data showcase the science, and it's just one more uh, one one more place where we can push uh, to influence public policy. So uh, this is the first time. I don't believe that there's ever been a select committee on climate uh, in, in, in the past. So the fact that Speaker Pelosi picked you to do this, set up this committee, and has made it a priority is uh, is pretty important. And as you said, uh, we've never put tax policy dealing with renewable energy in an infrastructure bill. So everything we're doing uh, has a future uh, look to it, uh, looking to figure out how we can improve things for uh, our future and for future generations. Kate, uh, Katie, you have another question? Yeah, all right, next question. This person says, clean public transit is a key tool to addressing the climate crisis and reducing greenhouse gases. Can you speak to how the federal government can help save public transit and transition it to clean fuels? You know, th th there's really a couple of issues here. Uh, there's the clean fuel side, and, and we've done quite a bit uh, over, over the years, uh, 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 providing federal money uh, to incentivize a uh, move to clean uh, fuel in, in, uh, in public transportation. But uh, right now, there's another crisis in public uh, transportation, and that's the economic fallout uh, from COVID. And uh, uh, public transportation uh, is uh, in a bit of a bind, as are all of our state finances and all of our local government finances. And that's why, uh, that's why, that's why Congresswoman Kathy Castor and Mike Thompson are both in Washington, D.C. tonight is because uh, we're back trying to um, push the Senate to take up uh, legislation uh, to provide uh, resources for all of the COVID affected communities of interest that uh, we represent across the country. Uh, about 120 days ago, we passed a bill uh, in the House that would do that, provide uh, resources to deal uh, with all of the economic uh, fallout from, from COVID. And uh, the Senate hasn't passed anything. And uh, they, they're not even willing to, uh, to start negotiating on this. And it's interesting because you know, uh, we did our bill, it was a $3 trillion bill. And we, uh, we have come back and said, okay, we can lower it to $2 trillion and still crickets from the Senate. Uh, Mitch McConnell uh, tried to uh, pass a bill that had the Senate Republicans' priorities, and he couldn't even get that passed. And that, that, was, a, that was $350 million of new money. So that, you know, that, it, it was a far cry from what uh, we need to do this. And what's really interesting now is uh, the negotiations between the White House broke down uh, when the White House uh, put the president's new chief of staff, uh, uh, Mark Meadows, who was, uh, served with both of us in the House and was kind of a bomb thrower. Uh, he didn't negotiate anything. He tried to kick his own speaker, John Boehner, and Paul Ryan, uh, both out of, uh, out, of, out of that spot. So he hasn't been willing to negotiate. Mitch McConnell hasn't been willing to negotiate. Finally, yesterday, the president came out 
I think this was after the chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve said, we need Congress's action in order to keep us from going um, broke uh, in, in the country. And, the, and Congress needs to act and act big. And uh, the president came out to, uh, yesterday and said, we need, to, we need to act big on this. We need to, 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 to move big against this problem financially. And uh, Mitch McConnell announced today that the Senate was going home next week. So it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's gonna be difficult to do all these things. We don't have cooperation uh, to direct the resources uh, to help out things such as public transportation. And Kathy, I'll turn it, I talked too long, go ahead. <laughs> Well, that's right. That's part of the reason uh, we're fighting so hard in the HEROES Act to maintain some support for our local communities and, and states. And when it comes to transit, that will keep them afloat, uh, really. But looking ahead, transit is key to solving the climate crisis. In our, in our report, we recommend growing the investments in public transit exponentially in addition to other alternative uh, modes of transportation, bicycle paths that I know Michael like, and, uh, and uh, more investment in, in walkways and urban areas and in rural areas. But what excites me about the investments in public transportation is decarbonizing them because the transportation sector is the largest source of carbon pollution. So this is an area where we've got to decarbonize the power sector, and that's the linchpin to decarbonizing the cars we drive, the buses, the large trucks. And what I get excited about uh, are these electric buses. Uh, already, uh, the US DOT, because of what we've done, we've done in Congress, they're dribbling out grants to local communities for electric buses, and we're targeting them to environmental justice communities, communities that have a legacy of pollution, and that's where we should start. But I, this is also a job creator too. On one of my trips to California, I visited a, um, an electric vehicle manufacturing plant down in Southern California, uh, Proterra, and they have those electric buses rolling off the assembly line. And think about what it means for our kids riding to school on those clean electric school buses not breathing in those diesel fumes and what an improvement in their health we can see over time. So the co-benefits uh, will grow as we as we move to the clean energy economy. Very well said, thank you. Katie? All right, next question. This person says, if the president should be reelected, what recourse does the Congress have to keep him from destroying the environment? Well, um, I, I like to think positive, so uh, I, I'm, I don't think this president is going to be reelected. Um, and all of the polls that I've seen lately suggest that uh, we're going to do very well in the House. Uh, we'll maintain our majority there. And every day we seem to be picking up tremendous ground in the Senate. So uh, if the election were today, uh, I feel very confident in telling you that we would maintain our majority in the House, we'd win the Senate, we would win the White House. Now the problem is the election's 45 days away uh, and a lot can happen. Uh, I, I, I expect to see four or five October surprises uh, uh, next month. But um, we're, we're gonna have a tremendous majority in the House and the Senate. And uh, if the unspeakable were to happen, uh, that will help us uh, check this guy and some of the crazy things that he has been doing and probably will continue to try and do if, as I say, the unthinkable happens. Hey, Mike, can we ask everybody to uh, call their grandparents in Florida or any of their cousins and uh, their, maybe their college roommates that, that live in Florida and make sure that uh, that's covered and they're, they're voting for their kids and their kids' futures, because we are at, uh, I feel kind of like we're on a cliff right now. And if uh, this election, I think is gonna be close, it could go either way. What we can do is work through our appropriations. We've been fortunate to have a lot of bedrock environmental organizations that have 
challenge these environmental rollbacks, but uh, this is dicey, and this is this is uh, the planet we're talking about. I think you all know the stakes, and we're, we'll just keep on keep on standing up to these horrendous environmental rollbacks, especially when it comes to climate. Well, I, I agree with you. The only thing that I would add is if your grandparents, your college roommate, your old army buddy, whoever it is, uh, if they live in Florida, most certainly call. But if they live anyplace else, call them too, because we yes. want to make sure everybody gets out and votes. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody votes and that every vote is counted. All right. Next question, speaking of elections, this person says, can you give us any reassurance that our vote will matter and that this election will be valid? I, I'll give you a lot of, uh, of uh, assurances that uh, every vote matters. Uh, everybody has to vote. I think this is, I think it's, it's pretty safe to say that this is the most important election in any of our lifetime. Uh, so uh, everybody's vote is very, very important. Uh, we need to, because, and you know, everybody knows all the problems uh, that uh, this uh, administration has caused, uh, appointing a very politically motivated postmaster general, changing the rules of the Postal Service. Uh, you know, they say that uh, no mail is going to be delayed. Uh, I, I'm one of those people, they say that uh, veterans and senior citizens uh, uh, get their prescriptions uh, overwhelmingly get their prescriptions through the mail. I, I'm a, um, a veteran with a combat uh, disability, so I qualify uh, to be able to get my medication through the Veterans Administration, and I get my cholesterol medication from them. And for the first time in my life, since I've been getting uh, the prescription from the VA, my uh, prescription is going on now three weeks late. And uh, so I'm one who believes that they can monkey with the, with the uh, Postal Service and mess up the delivery. So uh, make sure that you vote early. If you're gonna vote by mail, get your ballot in, ample time to get it into uh, the registrar of voters to be counted, or better yet, deliver it. Uh, there's gonna be delivery uh, drops uh, in, in every city in the country, or take it to the registrar of voters yourself and turn it in. Uh, do whatever you have to do to make sure your vote uh, is counted. That means vote early, make sure it gets there, and uh, encourage your friends to do the same thing. Kathy, you want to add anything? I, I do. You, I want to encourage everyone to go read our Solving the Climate Crisis action plan. Uh, it's at house.climatecrisis.gov. It's over 500 pages. We have a great executive summary, but at the end, we also highlight the fact that we, we're not just in a climate crisis, we're in a democracy crisis. And if we're truly going to tackle the big issues on transitioning to the clean energy economy and making our communities more resilient, we've got to get the we've got to tackle Citizens United. We've got to get the big super PACs back out, this big dark money. Part of the reason uh, that there have been so many roadblocks to climate action, the power of those big fossil fuel and energy companies over time have really blocked progress. And it's dark money and they, it, they should have to, at the very least, identify who they are, how much they're putting in, uh, but that, that's going to be key to climate. These are related. Yeah, the Citizens United uh, case, the U.S. Supreme Court really set us back. Uh, the, that allows uh, people to put what you refer to as dark money. That's money that uh, is spent on campaigns that nobody knows where it came from. And, uh, and, and that's just wrong in, in, in uh, any, way, uh, any way you cut it. So uh, we, need to, we need to get engaged. We need to stop this stuff from happening. It happens through the ballot box. And, you know, Kathy, you and I were both very, very fortunate uh, to serve in the Congress uh, with uh, one of the greatest American icons ever, uh, and that's uh, John Lewis, our, our colleague from, uh, from Georgia. I told someone the other day, uh, years from now, people will be taking a tour in the Capitol building 
and they're going to say, you know, this is an amazing building. Benjamin Franklin walked down these halls. John Lewis walked down these halls. That's the type of caliber uh, of, of a hero uh, he is. And I remember uh, going to Selma, Alabama with John for the 50th anniversary of his march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where he uh, worked uh, in a peaceful way uh, to make sure everybody had a right to vote. And it was on that bridge where, uh, where John was almost beaten to death. Uh, he was hospitalized, he was beaten so bad because he was working to make it possible for everyone to have the ability to vote. And uh, we, he and I served together on the Ways and Means Committee. And, and he told me, he said, you know, he said, I bled and almost died for people to be able to vote. So don't let that go, uh, don't let that go in vain. Uh, make sure that you exercise that right to vote and do everything you can to make sure everybody exercises their right to vote. All right, so next question. This person says, if or when oil refineries were to close down, can the federal government do anything to help replace the revenue local cities would lose and to help provide for the workers who could potentially lose their jobs? Well, I, I wanna kick that to Kathy, but before I do, I, I just wanna mention that I had a, a, a very interesting briefing uh, by P66 in Rodeo, uh, the refinery, uh, who, uh, who came to me uh, and uh, told me that they're doing a major shift and they're going to, uh, going to uh, revamp their plant uh, to do uh, more uh, renewable energy types of operation. Uh, and they tell me that uh, they're gonna see more people employed uh, at the facility. And I don't uh, see any reason why we can't uh, enjoy that type of success across the country. And Kathy, I imagine your committee is looking into these things. You bet. We, we're very cognizant of the fact that in this, uh, as we ramp up renewables, uh, a lot of those old fossil fuel plants or, or coal mining areas uh, will, we've already seen it in, the, in a lot of the coal communities, they're going to need uh, additional assistance. So in our report, we recommend some very significant uh, transition assistance. That means uh, community college retraining. It means empowering those communities to make those decisions about what kind of new industries. Uh, we think that the, in the clean energy economy, the supply chains will be entirely new. For example, we've got to build the modern electric grid, a macro grid, because a lot of the renewable resources are in the center of the country while the population uh, cl closer to the coast. So there is going to be significant new work, uh, especially in the Midwest as we build the modern electric grid. We also envision that extending broadband to rural areas can um, take a hike along with a lot of the building of the modern electric grid. In California, we've got to do more on distributed energy. Uh, we, we need to do more to prevent a lot of the fires that are being caused by uh, lines that aren't maintained, uh, that aren't operated correctly. We've got to bring in additional operators. So net-net, we see an enormous opportunity to create new jobs, but you're absolutely right. We have to be mindful that we're not leaving anyone behind and replace that lost revenue with new sources. You know, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate to do this on, on this in this venue, but uh, I have legislation that uh, would uh, bring FERC uh, into uh, the regulatory process uh, for uh, for local utilities uh, and for the for the uh, high line uh, uh, delivery system. You know, one of the problems we had in California, you mentioned it, the faulty equipment, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the federal government really doesn't have any say so on control over uh, local energy producers and distributors. Uh, so we're trying to bring FERC in uh, to set higher standards uh, for what type of equipment to use so we can cut down on those things. So look for that. Got it. <laughs> All right. Next question. This person says, aside from climate change, is forest management a participant in the crisis that we've been seeing with fires in California? 
Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, interestingly, I, I had a, a telephone meeting tonight uh, with uh, a, 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 a somebody who is a retired firefighter, plus has a big uh, a ranch and timber operation up in Mendocino County. And uh, we, were, we were talking because uh, uh, first, I, I have some experience in that. I, I carried the, uh, I wrote the state law in California that allows for prescribed burns. Uh, but a lot of things have changed uh, since then. There's uh, a million reasons why it's hard to do prescribed burns. But uh, he wants to work with me to figure out some uh, opportunities we have to better uh, manage uh, our, uh, our, uh, our lands. And uh, the federal government, we, we spend more money on putting fires out and, uh, and then we don't have any money left to prevent fires. Now there's been, over the last, course of the last couple of years, there's been some changes. Uh, we've kind of redistributed funding at the federal level. I know the state of California, that they, they appropriated $20 billion uh, for uh, fire prevention uh, in, in California. But that really is a, a drop in the, in the bucket. And, and it's not just forest fires. And the, the question, uh, the person asked the question, uh, said uh, uh, to, to better forest manage it to prevent forest fires. If you look at the fires that we've had, and, and Kathy, you mentioned you were in Santa Rosa right after the Tubbs fire. Well, that wasn't a forest fire. That was an oak woodlands fire, a wildlands uh, fire. So uh, it's not just the timber stuff. It's, uh, it's how do you take care of your property? If you own an acre or you own 5,000 acres, how can you possibly take care of it in a way so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's exempt from any type of, uh, of fire damage? We need to figure out ways to incentivize uh, landowners to uh, be better stewards of their property, make it easier for that to happen. Uh, my committee is looking at some uh, tax provisions that would incentivize uh, fire uh, prevention uh, activities, and uh, and we need you know we need to look at everything from that to uh, land use planning. Uh, do you do you permit houses to be built in the middle of the forest where uh, there's going to be uh, potential problems? And then going back to where we started in this conversation, you know I, I spent my I've lived my entire life in the Napa Valley, and uh, I don't remember anybody ever saying. Uh, hey, there was a fire started uh, in Napa County from lightning strikes. Uh, and, you know, it may have happened when I was a kid, but I don't, I don't recall it. And I know that the fires that we're dealing with right now in our district and the surrounding districts, that was part of a complex fire uh, that was started by lightning uh, that I think was 526 fires were started in my area uh, on, on that one night. And we know that the lightning came about and was, I guess, enhanced because of uh, offshore pressure systems uh, that caused this onshore uh, oddity to, uh, to, to happen. And it's directly related to the change uh, in, in climate. So I guess the shorter an short answer is, yes, we need to do everything to try and figure this out. Yeah, so in our report, we make a number of detailed recommendations uh, to be enacted into law. Uh, so here are a few. We want, we recommend that we give land, land management agencies better tools uh, for planning, for research, enhance their budgets. There are, talking with scientists and academics, there are so many new tools available to them and we need to make sure that local communities have access to all of that data and those tools. We need to map wildfire and smoke risk. We need to invest in wildfire resilience. We need to invest in research on forest health and wildfire behavior. We need to invest in electric grid infrastructure operations and maintenance to reduce the risk of fires being triggered by electric power. And we need to ensure uh, that our critical infrastructure like our hospitals uh, and other, other critical bu buildings have backup power. Uh, our report, uh, I recommend it to you again to go check it out. It's not just about reducing carbon pollution and the clean energy economy. It's the most detailed set of recommendations to the Congress in history 
on resilience because unfortunately we've waited too long and we're gonna have to adapt. And that means certain things in a, in a state uh, like Florida and it means different things in California. Perfect. All right, um, next question, sort of uh, similar to what you just mentioned, Congresswoman, this person says, According to NASA scientists, there isn't anything the USA can do alone to stop global warming as the greenhouse gases have already done their damage. According to these scientists, our response must include a path of adapting to climate change. What should we expect to do in the upcoming, dec upcoming decades, excuse me, to adapt? Yeah, we need to, the federal government has got to be a better partner to local communities. And that means yes, uh, making investments in clean energy and, and setting standards for electric vehicles and energy efficiency. But it, it means uh, starting especially in the environmental justice communities and communities of color that have long carried the burden of polluting plants. And we see it now with COVID, they're, they're disproportionately impacted by, by dirty air and health impacts. So we recommend a national climate adaptation plan be developed and that uh, we incentivize regional resiliency planning. We also recommend a, uh, a huge new civilian conservation core and a climate resiliency core that will again be um, a way to, to foster employment across the country. I know you all um, have met a number of these young, motivated, smart, folks that really want to be part of the solution, whether they're going into science or they're the folks I saw in the Smoky Mountains a few weeks ago, hammering out the, the trail. We have an enormous opportunity to make America more resilient, one community at a time, starting with our EJ communities. And so we lay out the roadmap and we need to enact those policies into law. All right. Next question. This person says, I have a 10 year old son who is very concerned about climate change and what it means for his future. With wildfires, smoke and sunless orange sky days are terrifying for all of us. What advice do you give kids who feel frustrated by the failures to adequately address climate change to date and what can they do to help? I don't think it's ever too young to get involved uh, in your community. And uh, I've seen some kids do some amazing things. Uh, tonight, before the town hall meeting, uh, I was at the dedication of the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. Uh, I'm the vice chairman of the commission for that. And we cut the ribbon tonight. And uh, there was uh, a school teacher there who was recognized because uh, his fourth grade class raised money to uh, build that memorial. Now, they didn't say how much, I have no idea how much, but I guarantee you it wasn't uh, one of the top uh, contributors uh, to, the, to the memorial. But uh, the point is uh, those young people knew they wanted to make a difference. They got together and they did what they could. And uh, I think we can see that same thing. We need, we need to hear from kids. And I, I know that we've had some uh, young people that have been very vocal on uh, issues that are important to our communities from gun violence prevention to climate change. Uh, some folks uh, uh, ridicule them uh, for being just kids, uh, but I think we need to encourage it. We need to encourage their involvement because as uh, all of the adults on this webinar uh, know, uh, time goes real quick. And these kids today are gonna be the leaders in our community and in our country tomorrow. So encourage them to get involved, encourage them to, uh, to get their classmates involved, push their teachers to get involved, create, let's create some weather. Let's, uh, let's get some momentum behind this and, uh, and, and, and make sure that our elected leaders know that the will of the people is to address climate change. And you know, Mike, there's a wonderful climate scientist uh, in Texas, Texas, a Texas Tech, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. And if any of you all are on Twitter, I encourage you to follow her. Um, 
what she always says is the most important thing is to discuss, talk about climate change, talk about it with other people, help them understand. And you all can talk uh, from some very unfortunate firsthand experiences. I mean, those, those pictures of the, the blood red sky, I mean, that, I think that was a wake up call to everyone across this country, across the planet. I mean, we went through the same thing watching those Australian wildfires. And I find right now that young people are more motivated than ever. And they can do what they can in their personal lives through whether that's, um, you know, the way they travel, the what they eat, uh, encouraging their friends, but they, we've got to do more on the macro scale uh, here and listen to the scientists. I know you all, the other wake up call was the, uh, the president comes to California and um, your go good natural resources lead to, corrects him and says, uh, he says, well, I don't think the science knows. And, and what is his name, Wade Crowfoot? He said, Mr. President, the science knows. And that, that's what we have to do that with all the misinformation out in the world, empower our young people to speak truth to power. And, and kids shouldn't sell themselves short. Uh, I can remember when uh, littering was a very common practice when I was growing up. People would throw their empty cans out the car window and their papers out the car window. And, and that was a massive campaign that started in schools. The whole give a hoot, don't pollute. And kids pressured their parents to change their ways. And, uh, and, and, and that's, a, that's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, when, the, when the kids are coming home saying, hey, this isn't right. You know, I learned today that climate change is, you know, you fill in the blanks. So uh, kids should be encouraged. They should be encouraged to learn about it. As Kathy says, talk about it, uh, research it, and, uh, and, and, and be outspoken about it. They're the ones that are going to inherit uh, whatever we leave them. And uh, it's in their best interest that we leave them a good, clean planet. All right, next question. Uh, this is for Congresswoman Castor. This person says, how is progress being measured in solving the climate crisis by your committee? Yeah, but so um, the report was uh, analyzed by an independent think tank, uh, Energy Innovation. And if you go into the report, I think it's, it's attached. Uh, what I'm focused on right now are the the biggest bang for the buck on reducing carbon pollution. And what that, uh, what energy innovation said is number one, uh, the power sector. So we, we want to enact a clean energy standard for the entire country that will help recalcitrant states like mine, the so-called sunshine state, and set that standard so they are transitioning to clean energy. And like I mentioned before, that's the linchpin to the decarbonization of the transportation sector. Uh, in addition to all of that and what Energy Innovation said, they, um, we've got to reclaim the mantle of leadership in the world because the climate change, as you know, is not a problem that's limited to the good old USA. We have got to um, go beyond just rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. We've got to go much farther and much faster than that. And that means we need to be working with China, India, the EU um, to, to ramp up our goals. The latest, some of the, the, the newest uh, reports that are out say that we were not even close to meeting those goals. And things are accelerating at such a pace that we have got to ramp up our level of ambition. So that's why this, uh, this election is critical. It's a vote for climate. It's a vote for uh, the moral obligation that we have to our kids and future generations. And we, we just have to press ahead and we have to act urgently. All right, next question. This person says, can the House of Representatives have an effective climate bill ready to go by January? I'll, I'll let you answer that, but <laughs> I know the answer is yes. 
Yeah, fortunately, uh, we are not starting from scratch. As I mentioned, um, a, a couple of days after our report rolled off the presses, we passed the cleanest and greenest infrastructure package in the history of the Congress that contained Mike Thompson's Green Act that is, is the pillar on tax policy pushing uh, innovation in for electric vehicles and in the power sector and in industrial processes and then uh, the defense bill. But some of the bigger pieces we are hammering out right now. We are going to be ready and there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes right now to get that in order and we're going to be pressing hard and, and Speaker Pelosi is, is already tasking us to have things ready to go. It looks like um, an economic stimulus package will be necessary and it will be uh, a, the cleanest and greenest and it will it will carry the level of ambition we need to for climate. Very good. All right, so next question, probably the last question. This person says, how can we trust that Democrats are treating this with the necessary urgency when even some of the most basic and crucial steps like banning fracking and ending fossil fuel subsidies aren't widely embraced? Kathy? Yeah, they, they are widely embraced. Um, the vast majority of member, Democratic members are in favor of banning new fracking. Uh, there, there will be a transition though for, because you can't flip a light switch and say everything comes to an end right away. We have, we have plenty to do. Uh, but I tell you, when we institute methane controls, when we set these standards, it's going to become even less uh, lucrative for them and they, they will be phasing out probably without uh, us coming down hard with the hammer. We do have to phase out those any fossil fuel subsidies that's on that's in our plan. We we simply can't afford uh, to waste one penny any longer. There we have got to put everything into clean energy. Great. Well, Kathy, um, I want to thank you very very much for coming on. It was really a joy to be with you. And uh, the next best thing to being with you in person. And uh, I think you uh, brought a lot of good information. And I know that there's still questions that people want to ask. Sadly, we're out of time. Uh, again, if uh, you email me, we'll get an answer to your questions. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, watching. And, and Kathy, I'd like to just ask if you have any closing remarks. Well, I, I want to thank uh, everyone out there in Napa, Sonoma, Santa Rosa, and uh, to the Northern areas, thank you for sending Mike Thompson to Congress. He is a leader in the Congress when it comes to clim the climate crisis. His Green Act truly is one of the linchpins in our sol Solving the Climate Crisis Action Plan. I encourage you to go and read it, at least read the executive summary, look into the fire management provisions and understand we are committed to acting urgently and ambitiously uh, to solve the climate crisis. So thanks, Mike, thanks everybody. Well, again, thank you. And I, I wanna thank everybody for, uh, for tuning in. Uh, this is clearly the biggest issue that faces us, not only as members of Congress, but as a people. Uh, th this is the biggest issue facing everybody in the world today. You know, if, if we got everything else right, if we did the best transportation bill, and the best gun violence prevention, and the best health care, if, if we were able to pass all those bills, if we don't get the climate issue addressed, it's all for naught. This is, uh, all the marbles are at stake in this. So uh, thank you for your interest, for, for uh, tuning in. Uh, Kathy Castor, uh, thank you for the great work you do in Congress and for the uh, marvelous job you do as the chair of the select committee. And I look forward to working with you and to, uh, to get uh, to see some success in these, in, in these measures. And I think together uh, we'll be able to all come out of this stronger and better. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to get some solutions done uh, on climate change. And it's going to be in large part because of your leadership. So thank you very much. And everybody else, thank you. Email in your questions and we'll get answers to you.
Thank you very much.